rock picking in Ozark Creeks is a popular pastime. That often leads to the question, what is this rock? Answering that question usually relates to what minerals make up the rock. But just what is a mineral anyway? And what's the difference between a mineral and a rock? You might be able to guess that these are minerals and these are rocks, but why? This is one of those sneaky questions whose answer seems obvious, but often isn't when you really delve into it. So today on Ozark Outsider, we're going to draw on examples from the Ozarks and beyond to discuss what makes a mineral a mineral, using a biological analogy to help you better understand these fascinating geological building blocks. Welcome to another episode of Ozark Wonderings, our series of short, FAQ-style videos giving brief answers to interesting questions about Ozark geology and more. We want you to consider how geological minerals might be analogous to biological species. Let's begin with some examples of what people might think of as familiar species. Oaks, hickories, white-tailed deer, and starfish. What? Starfish? Why not? And now, some common minerals. Feldspar, mica, quartz, and calcite. The underlying issue here is how we identify and classify things in nature. Ideally, we try to recognize a specific set of features that define an unmistakable identity, shared by nothing else. This is how the idea of a biological species is often thought of in layman's terms. For example, a white-tailed deer is readily identifiable to almost anyone based on its body shape, size, coloration, and so on. There are clear dividing lines between each of these species, and we can use known characteristics to classify individuals. This goal of being able to unambiguously categorize specimens is relevant to minerals as well. Similarly, the U.S. Geological Survey definition of a mineral emphasizes an orderly internal structure and characteristic chemical composition, crystal form, and physical properties. For example, quartz has a distinctive hexagonal crystal structure, unique chemical composition, a typically translucent appearance, a defined hardness, and so on. And we can use these characteristics to distinguish quartz from other minerals. Can you pick out the quartz crystal here? So we're suggesting that minerals are analogous to species, and that both can be thought of as having unique identities based on definable characteristics, at least in theory, though the biological reality is quite a bit messier. Speaking of which, biologists may be clearing their throats in response to our illustration listing oaks or hickories or starfish as examples of species. For example, oaks are actually a genus composed of a diversity of species. Here are some that occur in the Ozarks. Many individual trees can be easily identified to the species level. But in other cases, there can be some ambiguity. This is in part because a number of oaks can hybridize, meaning that different species can interbreed, and thus the boundaries separating species aren't as black and white. Biological reality often defies attempts at easy classification. Similarly, hickories and starfish are also broader groups of related species, while the white-tailed deer is actually a single species. Fortunately, geologists don't have this problem. Everything is nice and neat in the mineral world. Yeah, nah. Actually, geology has a similar complexity in distinguishing between specific mineral types, closely related groups of minerals, and broader classes colloquially treated as more specific than they really are. For example, the mineral name feldspar is commonly used as if it's a specific mineral, like quartz. But in reality, feldspar is a group of closely related minerals whose classification is at least as messy as for oaks. This is a ternary diagram, which looks really intimidating if you've never seen one before, so let's break it down. This lets geologists map out compositional changes between three closely related feldspars, the minerals orthoclase, albite, and anorthite. These three all share a similar base composition of aluminum, silica, and oxygen. But what distinguishes them is the presence of potassium, sodium, or calcium in their crystal structure. And where it gets messy is that there can be a spectrum of compositions between these end members. For example, as you slowly replace potassium with sodium, you move through several intermediate forms between orthoclase and albite, though the boundaries between these are somewhat arbitrary. The same process happens as you replace sodium with calcium on the spectrum between albite and anorthite. 
For anyone but a specialist, it's going to be hard to master the details of complex groups like feldspars or oaks, but they're common enough that familiarity with the group as a whole is pretty important. For example, feldspars generally share a distinct structural form that helps make them recognizable to geologists, in the same way that leaf shape is a distinct feature of the oak genus Quercus. Similarly, mica is another broad group of minerals that are extremely recognizable as a class due to certain unique features. This rock sample contains individual mica crystals. Its papery structure and reflective surfaces are quite distinct, as is a starfish's body plan but there's a good chance that identifying individual members of either group may require specialist knowledge or even equipment. In contrast, quartz and calcite are closer to the ideal of a well-defined species, being specific mineral types with diagnostic crystal structures and unique chemical compositions. But even with these, there are some complexities that we won't delve into here. The underlying structural organization of a mineral is ultimately defined by chemistry. You could think of this as somewhat analogous to the way DNA shapes biological species. But this also leads to an important practical difference between minerals and species. If you see a specimen of a species, say a bird, in a museum, that specimen is probably going to be similar to what you would see in the wild, in terms of size and general appearance. But minerals on display in a museum are likely to be a lot bigger and showier than specimens commonly encountered in everyday life. This Ozark limestone is primarily composed of calcite, but the only identifiable crystals are integrated into the small crinoid fossils. This has pros and cons. Identifying small and unshowy minerals can be challenging, but hey, at least minerals can't fly away. There is some good news when it comes to field identification of minerals, though. While there are over 10,000 biological species in the Ozarks, the number of common minerals is way smaller. Familiarity with a dozen minerals or mineral groups will get you a long way, and even that's more than you really need in many Ozark settings. But the practical details of mineral identification are a topic for a different video. Unfortunately, like most analogies, the parallels between species and minerals break down if you take it too far. For example, let's talk about the formation of new specimens or individuals. Have you heard that if you cut certain starfish apart, each piece can regenerate into a new individual? That's one way to generate a lot of new starfish. I wonder if we can achieve the same effect with diamonds. No! Don't do that! Mineral formation is definitely a topic for another day, but it's not at all like biological reproduction. We don't need to consider what happens when two quartz crystals love each other very much. So in this video, we've tried to make the point that geological minerals are loosely analogous to the concept of biological species, and that both attempt to define entities that can be grouped together by specific and identifiable characteristics. But gravel bars on Ozark Creeks won't normally turn up single beautiful mineral crystals, just rocks. But what's the difference? And how do rocks fit into our biological analogy? We'll explore that in the next video.